right, Steve, thank you for coming on. Steve Dawson, I should tell you your whole name. So, Steve, you are a financial advisor. Uh, can you give us a little bit about who you're with and a little bit about your practice? Um, I am the president and founder of Dawson Private Wealth in Allen, Texas. Legit. <laughs> uh, the broker dealer that I hire to process my trades and custody my clients' assets is Raymond James Financial. Um, I've been practicing well over a decade now. So actually, let's go into that just a little bit so people understand the financial planning world just a little bit better. Uh -huh. So you, you are the financial advisor, but financial advisors have a broker dealer. Yes. Okay, can you tell what that means? Um, depending on if the advisor is an employee or he or she owns their practice, um, the broker dealer is either your like employer and you have a sales manager or something like that, and that person's job is to regulate what you're allowed to sell and for the benefit of whatever the broker dealer is okay. traditionally. Uh, so if you're an employee, that's normally how that relationship operates. You traditionally will give a good chunk of your revenue or overhead or whatever you produce to them uh, for the safety of a salary. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I was driving down the road and I saw something like Edward Jones, that yeah. would be – Edward Jones, That he's an employee of the broker-dealer. That Edward is Jones. correct. But when I see Dawson, you know, finan wealth management. Uh -huh. Dawson, Dawson Private Wealth is a separate company that is independent of Raymond James. Yeah. So we've partnered together, and it's been a pretty beautiful marriage. But they help you with all like the regulations because it's so many. Oh my things. gosh, it's onerous to say the least, man. I know, and that's why I'm going to try to be careful what I ask you here today because I know you have so many regulations. That's okay. I know what I can say. Okay. <laughs> so if you, we ever get a, I can't talk about that. That's because there's a there's a rule. You'll get a no comment from me. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to go a little bit into uh, your story. Okay. Uh -huh. So you are from. Uh, South Dallas. So give me a little bit about where you grew up. Uh, South Oak Cliff mostly. Uh, went to Carter High School, went to Dallas Skyline, went to several different high schools um, um, as a result of moving around a lot uh, and being a knucklehead. Okay. <laughs> and then what changed for, uh, okay, so you, you're you growing up in that environment and then where did you go after that? Um, where did I go? Yeah, <laughs> to like, college. So you went to college. Where did you go to college? At? I went to Texas A&M University Commerce, blue and gold to my soul. Yes. All right. And did and uh, why did you go out to Texas A&M Commerce? Yeah, I stumbled upon it to be honest. I oh. I did not even know the university existed per se. I was actually supposed to go to OU on a partial basketball scholarship. Oh, and then you decided instead to go, and then you played. I played basketball for like all of one semester, hated it because they wanted me to change my major. Yeah. I wasn't thinking I was, you know, when you're, you know, some people lie about like what their college career was. I was okay. I was good. I wasn't about to get drafted. Yeah. Okay. Right. So knowing that I didn't want to like commit my whole educational, you know, curriculum to kinesiology so that the coach could, you know, have more use of me during practice times and things of that nature. So I decided to back out of that, and I picked up boxing and ended up loving it. Oh, so that's it. Is that common in yeah. college for the coaches to say, e, this major is too yeah. hard for you? It's more of an unspoken rule. It's not so much so that the major is too hard. It's more along the lines of pick a major that can be more conducive with our athletic schedule and traveling and practice and things of that nature. And in many universities, it's, it's pretty commonplace that – if the coach has a relationship with said dean or professor of a department, it makes it a lot easier for your basketball schedule to be uh, a bit more workable. So uh, what degree did you want to go? What did you go for? What did you get a degree in? Uh, undergrad was in, uh, it started out in computer science. And I was just doing that because my buddies were doing it. And it was just because I knew people in the, in the class and we were hanging out. But I was not as interested in it. Um, I did enough just to pass, you know, B minus and I was good, okay. but I was bored. So yeah. I changed my major to speech communications and I found that to be like the world of difference of seeing how people operate, seeing how people communicate. And I found that to be more exciting. And then you moved uh, and then you graduated. Yeah, I went to grad school. <laughs> and then you went to grad school. Yeah. What did you get a graduate degree in? Uh, managerial economics, business management, cousin to the MBA. It's, 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 we're talking semantics here, but yes. <laughs> okay, and did you do that at Texas A&M Commerce? I did. Okay, 
And then after that, you is that when you became a financial advisor? No, I was actually with my uncle at the time. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. My first job out of college, I was a loan officer with uh, Countrywide before oh, they yeah. before that. they fell under, and that was like that was my first experience in the real world, and it was horrifying yeah. <laughs> to, to be like your first real job job. Yeah. Right to be like the epicenter of the financial crisis. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, it was. It was weird. It was uh, uncomfortable. But I needed that experience for sure. And then you, then you, of course, the whole world changed. Uh, yeah. And then you, is that when you went into financial? Well, advising? during that time, it actually started in college. Uh, I have an uncle who uh, was in the Navy most of my life, and it was always travel. Majority of my family is Navy and Army. I may have been the only one that like didn't go. Oh, wow. uh, I went to business school and finance yeah. school. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, he began to teach me about economics and finance. And he told me about books that I should read. And um, the only way that I even had any conversation with him is that I was just visiting him one day on a break from college. He lived in East Texas. And uh, so I drove out there to see him. And um, I think he needed me to pass him a bill or something so he could pay. Yeah. It was something he asked me to grab off his table. I grabbed the wrong letter, okay, and um, it was the most legal money I'd seen in life. Yeah, <laughs> um, it was a Vanguard statement. I didn't know what that was or yeah. anything like that, but I was nervous because coming from the background that I had, seeing that kind of money normally meant something went really bad, uh, or something bad happened, or this was wealth uh, begotten by ill-gotten gain. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't want to be near that. Yeah. Uh, but then he explained to me what he did and how he earned uh, that. Um, and I said, hey, I want to learn how to do that. You yeah. know, and then he was like, do you just want to do it because you want to learn or do you just want to make some money? Yeah. And I was like, both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I <laughs> best, don't want to lie to way, him. Yeah. I don't want to lie to him. You know, I'd love to pretend like I was more studious than what I was, but not really. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so he, he said, well, Okay, if you're if you're serious, read this book and I'll talk to you more about it. Okay. Um, what uncle, book was it? Uh, it's called The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Oh. Written yeah. in 15th century English, it felt like I was reading the King James Bible in economics. Yeah. <laughs> that's how it sounded. I, I need to read. You know, in the last three days, mm -hmm. that's the second time someone has mentioned reading that book. Yeah. It's been that's it's, it's weird that you mentioned that too. So. Okay, so now you come out, you're, you're a financial advisor. And this is, to me, the amazing part of your story. Mm -hmm. The amazing part of your story is you're in a predominantly uh, white area. Yeah. In an industry that's predominantly a white male industry. Yeah. And you not only have started a business and run a business, mm -hmm. you're incredibly successful at it. I've been fortunate. Yeah. No, I mean, like... Out of the financial advisors I know, you're one of the best. And that overcoming those kind of hurdles, because it, it, contrary to what people want to say, it, it, there is bias that exists out there. And you have to overcome that bias sure. almost on a daily basis. Sure. And how were you able to do that? How were you able to overcome those things? Uh, you know, I guess perspective is a lot of things that to me that uh, help uh, facilitate a lot. You know, the saying, uh, life is... Uh, you know, 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. Um, I just kind of assumed certain things were just going to be a part of my American journey. Yeah. If you will, I, I knew that the hurdles would be a little higher for me. I knew that going into this industry, I was never uh, naive about the certain biases that would exist and that there would be some people that no matter how good I was or capable I was, I probably would never earn their business or trust predominantly because of what I look like or where I come from. But you overcame it. You overcame yeah. it by just, you just kept Grinding. striving for it. Well, because I didn't want to give myself an excuse for failure. I just don't come from that mold. That's not how I'm built. Um, I don't believe in giving myself an excuse for mediocrity. It's never been my own expectations. Now, when I first met you, you were still in the, I mean, you worked your butt off because you did door to door. Like, I sure did. You went door to door, knocked on doors and asked people to uh, give you your business. Do you have any crazy stories about that? Oh man, I knocked on 26,244 doors. You kept uh, track of it? I did. Wow. Um, and I have records of them uh, on paper in my office and some of them were like repeat door knocks, but yeah, I can't tell you how many times the police were called on me. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> so much so to where, you know, the, the officers knew who I was yeah. after a certain point. They knew, you know, I was, was a good guy. You know, I had a solicitor's permit and everything yeah. else. But uh, for some odd reason, you know. The, <laughs> the black guy the black guy in my neighborhood, he's uh, knocking on doors in a, uh, in a white suit and tie. Well, I mean, look, I mean, either he, you know, I, I get it, right? Yeah. I'm not going to lie. But six foot three, 250 pound black guy knocked up on my doorstep and was talking about financial planning. It's not something I see every day. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I get it. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, that obviously you want to try to. You know, read the book before you judge the yeah. book, but that's not necessarily how things get done. In the so the police world. go like, start going. That's just Steve Dawson. Please leave him alone. Uh, in part, yes. Uh, yeah. Officer Mike Such with the <laughs> Allen Police Department. <laughs> you even know him. Yeah, yeah. we have a relationship. <laughs> He's actually a good friend. Oh wow. Um, and uh, we're actually looking at doing some investment stuff together also, but that's oh, a whole other issue. Man, got you a client too. Well, not yet. <laughs> see, <laughs> Hopefully. See, have uh, have a positive attitude. You never know where it's going to take you. Well, he was just always polite to me, and I always appreciated that. And honestly, the, the whole Allen Police Department, because after you get pulled over so many times, you kind of get experience with everybody yeah uh, so overall they were extremely helpful courteous to me i never felt you know it was just it was a good experience all the way around so you're by nature as long as i've known you you politically have been a conservative yeah i do lean i'm more independent but i lean conservative i'll admit that and um but you ventured into a, an interesting world because mm-hmm. you're, you're now in like where I am, where I'm traditionally conservative, but I'm in a Trump world, which is very <laughs> different than conservative values or being uh, true. true. So how, what is your perspective on uh, being a conservative man mm-hmm. and now having someone in the White House, which in my opinion, he's really not a conservative, mm-hmm. uh, but he's supposed to be representing the conservative party. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, he does some things that are conservative, but there's a lot of things he does not. Sure. So how have you dealt with it being an African-American man and then also witnessing your party move to a kind of a weird area? Uh, things are in a different place for sure. I will admit that as far as the, the political spectrum and the pendulum, there's definitely been a swing, uh, especially with the new administration. Uh, and I guess per traditional definition, right, in a myopic view, no, uh, the existing president does not have a traditional conservative background, right? In fact, most of his years he was a Democrat uh, uh, before he was a Republican, right? Yeah. And, you know, gave to both parties. You know, that's what most business guys do. You try yeah. to curry favor on both sides just in case, you know, either side wins. So yeah. uh, so with that regard, yeah, there, there's there's issue there. Um, but my traditional outlook on it is, is I espouse the principles and not the people. Uh, because the people will always be imperfect, no matter what p- particular political party is is in office. Uh, but the principles of conservative values I espouse uh, to anyone: self accountability, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, free free market capitalism, uh, to the ability to be able to go out, start a business, right, create an idea to drive profit to sustain sustain myself and my family. Uh, to be able to teach a man how to fish versus give a man fish. Uh, so from those particular pieces of the uh, the party, I still can support wholeheartedly. So if you had you know, young man like yourself, uh-huh. you were trying to sit down, you were trying to talk to him today about moving forward in this world, uh, what things do you believe in your life, what principles mm-hmm. have you maintained that have – been giving you the ability to overcome so many obstacles? Um, well, I, I would first say that a majority, if not everything, to me starts and ends with my faith in Jesus Christ. Um, I don't hide who I am. I don't hide that as being my value system. That is my worldview. Um, I do my best to view people um, the way my faith teaches me to view people. And that's not necessarily what their race is or their political ideology. Uh, my faith comes before my race. So at the end of the day, that's the way I view the world. That's how I interact with the people in it. Okay. And then, so you get your faith that's a, a huge anchor in your life and keeps sure. you grounded and everything. And then as you've gone through, you've shared some things about your story, which is this unimaginable ability to persevere even when you get rejected. Yeah. And how do you? How, that's so hard for so many, especially young men. Yeah. To handle rejection, how do you handle rejection? 
uh, it's kind of calculated in uh, for me. <laughs> uh, but to some extent, I get it. You know, the if you're if you're novice or newer to you know like my industry, you know, you do a lot of presentations, and sometimes you don't get the deal. Sometimes you don't land the business or whatever the case may be, um, and you have to try not to take things personal. And then also know that just because you got told no that particular time, it doesn't mean that there may not be another opportunity for you uh, in the future. So it's important to not uh, burn bridges, right? But to be respectful and humble uh, in your defeats and your successes. Yeah, one of the, I think the biggest things that if you can learn in your life is, I, I remember this uh, study that was done, in, or it wasn't a study, it was some psychologist that was saying, so young men mm -hmm. uh, struggle with rejection, especially with women. That's one of the biggest and most difficult things to experience. Right. And so he couldn't get young men to get out there and to actually, you know, ask a girl on a date. Yeah. So he made this uh, woman, or sorry, this this young man sit at the bottom of an escalator and ask every woman that came down on a date. And so this and did it work? Yeah, it, it actually once he got rejected a, a hundred times. His whole goal is I want you to get rejected a hundred times. He learned that it doesn't mean anything. It's like just people have different opinions. They're different. It's not you. Yeah, they're just absolutely. They're going on with their life. And he actually, I think it was something like ten girls said, "Yeah, I'll go on a date with you." That's awesome, man. Looked yeah. like his calendar's booked. Yeah, you know, it looked like things are looking up. Do you, so out of those two thousand. <laughs> Whatever people that you yeah. you knocked on their door, uh -huh. how many became a client? Conversion ratio is about uh, less than five percent. So less than five percent. Yeah, ninety five percent of your day was people going, "Oh my gosh, I don't want to talk to this person." Yeah, well, maybe they didn't say that. I mean, yeah. sometimes your facial expression can yeah. say that. Uh, sometimes you can slam the door in someone's <laughs> face that can say that. Uh, you know, in speech communication is my undergraduate, right? That 56.2% yeah. of all communication is nonverbal. So the door slamming is another way to say that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, short answer is that, yeah, I mean, I just kind of accept it. I don't, I don't take it personal yeah. at all because I'm not entitled to success. So at the end of the day, I don't, I don't suspect like, oh, it has to happen for me because I'm me. It's going to happen for me because I'm going to put the work and the effort and the game plan together to execute it. And, and as you've seen, your life has kind of changed, I've noticed, yeah. in the fact that now you don't have to knock doors all day for no. business. You can actually, yeah. people uh, come to you. That was years ago. Yeah. <laughs> people come to you now and ask for, yeah. for advice and everything. And, yeah. and, but if you were to take it, your, your abilities haven't changed that much. No, not at all. Yeah, but your experience has because of your determination. Yes, yes, in part, but in majority, yeah, majority of my clientele is referral based now. I don't do much advertising. I will do some, or I may do some dinners or something like that here and there. But for the most part, I don't do hardcore advertising anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been fortunate, you know, I don't necessarily need to do that anymore. Yeah. So you know that that's been a good feeling. It's uh, a lot better than being in a um, hundred degree weather in a suit in Texas in the summer. Yeah, I remember when you first told me that's what yeah. you did, and I was just like, oh my gosh, that would be such a beating. And I was like, what if an attorney did that? I mean, would you be really, real creeped out that their attorney was knocking on the door asking for business? I mean, in all honesty, man, you never know until you ask, and yeah. I've learned that, and I've met some of the greatest people in my life at the door. Yeah. From relationships that I've built, that people are, are more friends to me than they are clients, because you get a chance to see so much of their life. You, you go through stuff with them. Like you're with them when things are going good, you're with them when things aren't going so good, and you become like a trusted friend, right? It's more than just like, oh, that's my advisor, he handles my money and our financial stuff, right? It's more of, no, that's Steven, who's my friend, and oh, by the way, he's also my financial guy. Well, yeah, I actually think you did it the right way. The right way to be actually be a financial advisor is someone that is there personally for people because... The, the really the hardest thing with finance is the understanding that you can't really manipulate anything. No. There's no secret sauce out there. <laughs> Even you, though there are people that try to assume they are, but no, you're right. But the worst enemy to finance is usually yourself because yeah. you panic. And being the financial advisor that has a relationship to tell someone, hey, uh, I understand things are going bad. Right. But you got to trust the system that it's going to work out. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, it's called good bedside manner. It's like any medical doctor, right? You know, you don't want to get in there, you see your clients, you know, freaking out. Then you're like, yeah, you're right. Things are pretty bad, right? Yeah. Like, if, that's not the guy I need, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's probably not who I want, uh, you know, helping me. I need somebody that's going to be the, the consistent, rational, calm voice in the midst of whatever financial storm may be going on to help reassure me. Yeah, like I had, I when I was in, College is when the financial crisis happened, and I was actually uh, getting my master's in personal finance. Yeah. Now, the family member that um, uh, didn't call me but decided to go into his, you know, financial advisor, and the financial advisor, the pretty much the lowest point of the market, mm -hmm. told him to cash out everything he had and put it in an annuity. Wow. Yeah. And uh, wow. the worst advice you can have. Because if you would have called me, my my point to him would be, um, if it keeps going down, money's not going to be worth anything, because everything will fall apart. Yeah. So you have nowhere. You, you can't go lower. Right. It's like either it's going to fix itself, or money means nothing. So True. it doesn't matter if you have two hundred thousand dollars in your account. Yeah. And I have I also another client. Yeah. Same experience, but instead of him pulling out his money, his advisor said, I want you to take out a million dollar loan and put it in the market right away. Now my family member, they make it by, they, they do just fine, they do just fine, but my friend now, who listened to his advisor that knew what he was talking about, is worth $22 million. I can help. Yeah, <laughs> it was a totally different experience because yeah. the one advisor knew. He says, you're gonna take out this loan, if it keeps going down, you're going bankrupt anyway. It doesn't matter. There's really no risk to you in this situation. And not only are you going to go bankrupt, the whole system is going to go bankrupt. So it's completely pointless for you to pull your money out. Mm -hmm. In fact, you should double down right now. And that that is that is a, an amazing yeah. ability that, that that advisor had to see the future and understand what needs to happen. Well, you know, perception is everything in financial markets. Um, contingent upon what your availability bias is, what you feel is already what's wrong with the world, people have a tendency to look for things to reinforce that. So traditionally, a good advisor should be able to sit outside of that and be able to look at the longer term picture and uh, be able to you know, direct people according to that as opposed to what their emotions may be driving them to do. Right, you know, people know the term buy low, sell high, but yeah. for whatever reason, this industry is the only one where people will intentionally buy high and sell low. But like none of us would go to shop at a store to intentionally purchase a shirt that we know costs more. Yeah. Right? None of us would do it. We would wait till it went on sale, right? And then we'd go buy. But for whatever reason in my industry it's the only time where it's opposite. <laughs> yeah, so I was I was reading a book and it was talking about the French uh it was it was back in the seventeen hundred. Oh no, it must be in the sixteen hundreds. But um, there was the Mississippi stock uh, uh, something. I, I I don't know the exact name of it, but basically, guys went around and said, "Hey, Mississippi is this golden opportunity where there are gold mines, and you're gonna make a bunch." And they started selling uh, stocks to a bunch to, in, in France, mm -hmm. and um, the stocks they you know st they started off with a few hundred. Uh, not dollars, but I don't know what the French currency was then. But then it went up to a few thousand, to three thousand, to four thousand, and people started selling everything that they had, and they bought this, and it got all the way up to about ten thousand. I don't uh -huh. know what's going. I'm going to call it dollars, dollars. <laughs> and then everybody started going, hmm, that's a little absurd. And so of course it started to fall and it started to collapse. And the French government realized if they didn't fix this, mm -hmm. that it was going to collapse the whole system. So the French government started to buy up all the stock and it eventually bankrupted the the royal family, the, the mm -hmm. French royal family. It sounds eerily similar. Yeah. <laughs> it does. <laughs> like, like, oh, we're, we're going to have a, a new system. But uh, but right now in, in everything, uh, I, I try to explain a lot of times, like a lot of our system is just built on trust, that we trust. Actually, as a number one factor of it. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of interesting because the word faith in the Bible means trust, mm -hmm. you know, and it's amazing what we've accomplished because everybody trusts the economic system. It's amazing. Yeah. Growth and wealth, the amount of wealth that's been created over generations uh, for trusting the system and capitalism as a whole. 
And to be frank, uh, I don't necessarily trust the system as much as I trust people's capacity to be greedy. Oh, yeah. And as long as greed is still a thing, quite frankly, the stock market has good prospects long term. Well, that, that, <laughs> that brings up a great question because on the one hand, greed, uh, we look at it as a negative thing. Mm-hmm. But capitalism has shown that greed can also cause great things to happen. Yeah. Because if somebody's willing to reinvest their capital to get more money. Absolutely. Now, I, I don't believe in the greediness of hoarding wealth. Right. When you take wealth, you hide it in your, your mattress. I think that's actually evil. Mm-hmm. Because if you take your wealth and reinvest it, I don't care how wealthy you get. Right. But if you're going to reinvest it, and as long as you don't use human beings as slaves to your system, mm-hmm. you know that you respect other people. And you're willing to make a profit, but also respect another human being and their capacity to make a living themselves. Right. I think that 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 kind of greediness that you're going to reinvest and get mm-hmm. more and more is actually a good thing. Well, what I find interesting in your statement is that you know there's ethics in your statement that in a pure capitalist society, ethics are not necessarily relevant uh, as much as it is a bottom line figure. So. Case in point, if XYZ company doesn't earn 5 or 8% uh, growth earnings estimate and hit, hit its numbers every year, it doesn't matter that the company's wildly profitable, but if they miss their earnings projection, then that stock takes a hit. Yeah. Well, that's a great point. Uh, can you explain a little bit why you can't just have a, a pure capitalist society? Well, I think that you know if we're going to assign ethics as something that is important, that first we have to accept the fact that ethics means totally different things depending on the person and or group that you're dealing with. So in a pure capitalist society, ethics doesn't necessarily work uh, simply because then at that point we have to put a cap on production. We have to put a cap on how much money is too much money to be made. We have to put a cap on well, how should we utilize our assets and what is a, a well-received definition of ethics of how to spread money around. Right. Or or using your term slavery. Right. Yeah. Or if the average CEO earns you know, 378 times more than the average employee, is that slavery? Yeah, well, then you have the problem of, like, human beings' ability to go, when things get so unfair, human beings are fair for you. Right. So, and so if they can't perceive fairness in the system, even though in America it's wonderful right now. Yeah. It's great here. But there is this growing disparity of fairness, and yeah. human beings can't exist in society. And I, I think we talked about this a little bit. But if you take a tribe in Africa where everybody makes the same, they're happy. Yeah. Or if you take I mean, you can take a tribe anywhere in the world. If right. you take a tribe anywhere, everybody's equal, everybody will be happy. You take one person in that tribe and give them all the wealth. The f- more wealthy that one becomes than the other ones, the more miserable the other ones become, even though their situation might improve. Right. And that's the hard part about capitalism is you have to understand human behavior to a point. Right. So then there's so th- there's so many challenges within that. So, yeah, human behavior, you have the capitalist approach of we want to grow. Right. Because at the end of the day, capitalism and quite frankly, greed to some extent does birth great things. It helps people innovate. Yeah. So the ideal is, is that one of the reasons why I prefer a capitalist st- structure in society versus, let's say, a socialist one is that in a capitalist society, I am rewarded for my innovation through the market that I'm trying to serve because that good or that product that I'm putting out is now in a higher demand. And as a result of such, uh, the market is willing to pay me a higher price for that versus in a socialist system then that wealth that I'm earning is simply going to be taken and redistributed according to what someone else's definition of fairness is. Yeah. No, and I agree. And then, but you, but like, this is the hard part I have with a lot of my conservative friends is under, understanding that, you can't have a pure capitalist society because mm-hmm. if it's always about growth and making money, then you end up like people don't understand. Slavery wasn't about racism. Mm-hmm. Slavery was about it was about making profits. Money. That's the only color that mattered more than your race. Exactly. This is how much money that person or that property at that time could generate. And the dehumanization of people and that sad time specifically. Uh, in our country's history, was you know a, a real stain. Uh, yeah, because because the people sitting in there making the money, it it was all about the profit. Well, how much do we make? Yeah, it wasn't about how we treated people. It took us hundreds of years to come up and go, whoa, whoa, yeah, capitalism has these positive parts to it, right? But it has this horrific part to it too. 
Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, there there is a side effect to greed. Yeah. Is that if ethics are removed and morality and values of, of human decency are removed in a pure capitalist society, that's what it actually looks like. Yes. Uh, and to be honest, in a democratic society, you will have the haves and the have-nots, yeah. theoretically speaking. So, for example, in economics, we consider 4.5% unemployment. We consider that to be full employment of the whole economy. Yeah. So meaning yeah. that we just assume that at least 4.5% of the population just won't have a job. Yeah. And we're okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. That's in pure economics. That's what that means. Right? Yeah. So in the capitalist society, we just basically bake that in, that there will be some people or some groups that will be disproportionately affected by the decisions of other people or the decisions of themselves. So I want to wrap this, this up and have you give... Uh, a little plea to people out there that are in the conservative party because because we did because because the Republicans did win but we're having a, I don't I, at least I don't foresee us winning winning the next election mm-hmm. the, now the, the the left can cause it to happen because if they don't get their their side under the control it's like we we've gone to two extreme craziness. Yeah. And it's like, you need to put somebody up that's kind of in the middle. Uh-huh. You get them on your side. Yeah, if you want them a little left, go ahead. But you can't go completely. But if you were to make a plea, I'm foreseeing that okay. Trump is not going to win. So there's going to be a mass like depression that's going to happen right after that. Because <laughs> all the conservatives are going to go, we lost our soul. And they're, you know, they're going to be all you know whining about that kind of a situation. But when that happens... Uh, what was you, what's your advice for the party? What do they need to do? Well, I mean, there, there are a few things, quite frankly, but let's let's you know, reverse a little bit. Uh, the Democratic Party, in my view, from what I'm looking at, is trying to figure out who they want to be. Yeah. Right. Like, there's a battle for do we want to be more proudly embrace the label of socialist? Yeah. Right. Do we want to embrace that? That's one element that I see in the party. Then there's the moderates that, quite frankly, are becoming more like unicorns by the day. Yeah. They're being cannibalized. Yeah. Right. But the reality, if you're looking at any polling data right now, um, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren are respectively at about 15, 16 percent each in the polls. And Joe Biden is at about 31 to 33 percent. Yeah. Uh, Joe Biden represents even with all his gays. Yes, with is all is it gays or gas? It's gas, but it's gas. okay. We're going to let you. It's okay. Dang, I always get that one wrong. It's out there. It's too late yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the good. point it's is, be on the internet. I'm but humiliated. thirty-one to thirty-three percent is still hanging with Joe Biden, and he, in by many circles, represents the moderate side, yes. right? So the challenge is, is that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are going to have to find a way to appeal to the moderates if they have any chance of winning the national election. Right. Because statistically speaking, the country is still moderately center right. Yeah. Uh, and that has been proven throughout different election cycles. Um, I don't know that the uh, country is quite ready for an avowed socialist, per se, yeah. or the policies that may come with that. Or quite frankly, I'm not sure if the country is really understood of what they're meaning when they say, I'm a socialist or I embrace these policies, right? Yeah. So there's, there's that part, right? And then the Republicans... Uh, but but to go back, the Democrats, if they don't sort out who they want to be, they are quite capable of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they can find great, a way to way do out. that. Um, and as far as the Republicans are concerned, I think they're going to have to understand the fact that they're preaching to a smaller tent. The more and more that, you know, alienation of minorities um, take place. It's just a matter of mathematics here from a growth standpoint, right? I get it. Currently, Trump is at an 88, 89% approval rating within the Republican Party right now. He is more popular than Ronald Reagan within the party. Wow. Statistically. And I I thought I was a normal Republican. Uh, I don't know who they're polling. In all honesty, I've never identified with the party because I've voted for both sides. So so technically, but I usually vote for a Republican because I'm conservative. But... Uh, so I, so I thought more people were like me. I guess I'm I'm, I'm different. I'm, I mean I don't know. I mean the reality is I don't know if those polls are all just happening in Mississippi or what. I don't know, right? But yeah. I'm just saying. But from the polls that are released nationally, that he is having uh, moderate success at least within the party. But the challenge is, is he's alienating the independents. Yeah. That quite frankly pushed him over. 
Uh, and that, you know, is really where I am on that spectrum. Yeah. Right. As far as the independent leans conservative. But yeah. I would vote for a Democrat in a heartbeat if the guy makes sense or the gal makes sense. Well, I vote a lot. A lot so it so. just it just depends on what what is there and what's in front of me personally. So I think the Republican Party is going to have to work on their message toward the minority community and finding a way to be authentic and genuine. In other words, don't just care about black and brown people when the election's about to start. Yeah. Right. Don't just show up. Oh, we want your vote. Mm -hmm. You know, stop talking down to us and have a conversation with us and then be willing to accept that there'll be things that you will hear that you may not agree with. Make you feel uncomfortable. That you make you feel slightly uncomfortable, but it's still worth you listening to and possibly incorporating in your platform. Yeah. And it will have to be a longer term effort because, quite frankly, the minority community has been voting Democrat the last 50 to 60 years. Yeah. Regardless of who the Democrats put up there. So what I'm saying is that it will be a much more of a longer haul, but it will have to be a different party. And the culture of the party today, quite frankly, is not in a position to really appeal to minorities, quite frankly, women uh, or, you know, it's just. Yeah. It's 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 going to be a, a much harder sell if the person that is the face of the party is not an embodiment of those values to everyone. What would be one thing, one hmm. thing the Republican Party could do to say, hey, this this is probably if you could adopt this. I think the notion that America should be smaller by boxing and closing themselves off. Um, I think the embracing of diversity and inclusion and understanding that America has and always will be a melting pot. So immigration. Um, I think it could start there. Okay. I'm not calling for amnesty by any stretch, but at the same time, I am saying that uh, referring to people from other countries or, or S-H-I-T whole countries, as our president has referred to them yeah. as. Um, yeah, not, not the best way to you know, so that that's probably not the best appeal, yeah. right? Um, doing that or calling you know people you know, rapists and this that and the yeah. other. I think the terminology, I think, and the the, the 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 adjectives that are used to describe people that are different. Yeah, different countries. Yeah, different countries doesn't necessarily mean that they're anti-American because they don't view things the way that you yeah. do things. And, and for someone who supports Trump, I, I don't like bad guy people. If you, if you want to support Trump, that's totally okay with me. Um, but understanding that he's never called a European country. No. Uh, S-H-I-T hole. Yes. He never he referred not. to white immigrants as rapists. No. And so, like, like, understanding that part and just being like, okay, I, do I believe personally in Trump's heart he's a racist? No, I don't believe he is. I believe Trump's about him. That's how he is. And But when you say these things only about certain type of countries, mm -hmm. countries usually of color, it does appear like you are. Yeah, you know? it does. And, it, and, it, and people go, oh, well, that's it's, – it's a natural bias. And I understand that it's like I believe – and I do a little different in defining racism. I – don't believe in the idea that you say, well, if you say anything about any other group, it's a racist comment. Mm -hmm. I believe the, uh, racism is something that you inwardly want uh, a difference. You, you, you want your group to, be be to get more than the other group. I do believe human beings have natural bias to people that look like them. Yeah. And so you go wherever you go, you're going to find a group. If you go to Asia, People in Asia are going to naturally favor people of their own country, their own that look like them. Mm -hmm. It's something that we all have to recognize and go, okay, this is a part of me as a human being. And it, I imagine it was a protection mechanism back in the day. It's kind of necessary now mm -hmm. that you have to arise above it and go, okay, I understand this person's different. They come from a different place. They speak a different language, but they can still be a part of my group. Yeah, I just think the part that we have to do a better job of defining America as an ideal and not a, a color or a people group. Mm -hmm. uh, American uh, in itself is an embodiment of an idea of freedom, of acceptance of no matter who you are, where you come from, we have this opportunity for you, right? That yeah. there's something special about this place that is not as prevalent other places and that we celebrate the fact that 
you come from wherever you come from, and we appreciate it. Bring some of that culture here too. We want to learn more. Yeah, well, that that should be easy for conservatives. Because that's the that, that's the conservative platform is that you believe in individual individual mm-hmm. not based upon you know where you come from where you are but it seems like that the conservative party has turned into the party where well we have different quotas for different groups of the world where you come from mm-hmm. we're gonna we're gonna I mean the reality of it is that there's there's a lot of that and you know America is changing from a demographic standpoint I mean just do the numbers by 2040 there will be a president Calderon or President Patel at yeah. some point. Exactly. I'm just sorry. At the end of the day, that is just how that's going to look just by the numbers. Yeah. You know, I don't think that's a bad thing. But unfortunately, the way that the Republican Party has positioned itself on some of these arguments by either not forcefully speaking out against some of it and remaining quiet, because to me, remaining quiet is just as peer is speaking loudly about it by not standing up for it. Yeah. The only thing we need is for good men to do nothing. Yeah, and it's. I wish there's an easy answer to these questions, but uh, I think that's the hardest part. Is when you're with human beings, we claim to be rational beings, but we're really not. Right. We we're based a lot on our emotions and our fears, and in honesty, how do you win elections? You scare people. Yeah, people people the same way they buy stuff, right? They yeah. vote like. It's spontaneous habit or fear, like some yeah. fear of retribution of some sort. And the dog whistles, quite frankly, that have been used uh, in the existing elections, and this is on both sides, I've seen. Yeah. Uh, this isn't just a Republican thing as far as using dog whistles. The reality of it is is that I've heard Democrats on platforms and leadership do the same thing. Yeah. To just try to say, hey, these people hate you. They yeah. want to do this to you, so you better vote for a Democrat, right? Yeah. It's that I mean, there's it's the same thing is just happening, just on a different side of the coin. Well, yeah, I would just say, and on the on the left side, they use the division of people yeah. as a mechanism far more than the right does. The right does, I mean, it may be happening, you know, not verbally among people on the right, but on the left, they actively go to communities and go. You are you are different than this group. Yeah, there's a label for everything now. Yeah. And quite frankly, if you say anything unintentionally or, or intentionally that could have possibly offend one of these newly created labels, right, then quite frankly, you are a whatever new word that they call you now. Yeah. Right? And that's like if you don't agree with, you know, such and such lifestyle, you're a homophobe. If you yeah. don't see things this way, you're a that, right? And that's the box that, you know, have been created to separate people. And quite frankly, I just think that the average person individually is very intelligent and that you can have a conversation with people that maybe you don't see eye to eye on everything on and you can have an intelligent discussion. It's when people get in groups where they become stupid. Can uh, could Trump ever win you back? <laughs> First answer is he never had me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, could he win you back to the Republican Party? Uh, you know, I, I remain open-minded to a lot of things. I would never close my mind off to anything. Okay. Uh, because I think that, you know, it depends on what's in front of me. Because, quite frankly, if there is an avowed socialist on the other side, you know, there is, you know, right now it's 50-50. Yeah. At this point, it just depends on what the messaging is at this point. Because, quite frankly, the industry that I work in, that would directly affect me. So, is it like he shut off his Twitter, apologized for all the things he said, and said, I, I have accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm going to... The problem is that if that happened to happen in campaign season, I would probably vote for the Democrat because I wouldn't believe it. Oh, you'd be like, oh, he's just doing this to get my vote. Because it would be too convenient. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I w- it wouldn't be believable for me. And then I would assume that you're taking my intelligence uh, and you're yeah. you're insulting it at a, yeah. after a certain point. And quite frankly, my IQ's too high for that. Yeah. <laughs> just trying to manipulate you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Steve. Well, thanks for coming and talking about it. You have an incredible story. Uh, I don't think people appreciate um, I think you are a great example for especially kids in South Dallas or if you have a young man who's struggling somewhere to understand perseverance. You focus on a goal, you get things done, you can accomplish almost anything. It, you know, you can overcome incredible amount of biases and prejudices against you and you're a perfect example of that. I really appreciate uh, your compliments. Thank you.